Welcome to the Musicians Hall of Fame backstage. I'm Joe Chambers. Our first guest tonight is J.I. Allison, the drummer from the Crickets. When we come back, J.I. Allison. Okay, J.I. Hey, Joe. How you doing? Good. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. So, one thing that we want to do on the show is we want to talk about things that everybody would be interested in, but really geared toward more musicians. So, every musician, every drummer is going to want to know what kind of drums you prefer, what did you start out with, how did you get started? So, let's just start with that. How did you get started? What made you want to be a musician? I went to a football game when I was uh, probably in the fifth or sixth grade, and I wanted to play the bass drum. And so I went to the uh, band director in, in elementary school like in, in Plainview, Texas, and, uh, and he had me like pat my foot and go boom, boom. He said, you'll do. And so my folks ordered me a drum from Sears and Roebuck, and I played that. and, and the, uh, that and then I played in junior high school and then I played in high school and I played in Texas Tech band, marching band, and the marching band and the concert band and, and uh, sometime in junior high school I took drum lessons which didn't hurt me a bit but uh, I really enjoyed the whole deal and uh, I went to Tech for 14 weeks. What kind of drums did they get you? Uh, I don't think, I don't think the Sears and Roebuck had, Roebuck had one. The first uh, trap set they call them was a uh, Slingerland, and uh, of course it was used. And the guy had lights in the tom toms, and the bass drum. Every time you hit it, it had a Hawaiian scene on it. It'd light up purple. And, That's pretty cool. Uh, but the only problem with that is when you light a light bulb in a drum, it goes bonk, 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 <laughs> bonk, 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 bonk. It gets higher and higher. Because the, the heat, made the heat, the heat oh, you know, the, okay. the heat from the light bulb. But after that, uh, uh, Buddy and Don Guest, and I, Buddy Holly and Don Guest, and I went on a tour which is why I quit. Well, only got 14 weeks of Texas Tech in. Uh, a guy hired us for the backup band for George Jones and Cowboy Copas and uh, Hank Lachlan. You know, it was one of those cowboy tour or uh, country music tours with like 10 people on it and Justin Tubb. And, what year was that? Uh, 56. And uh, so I couldn't, couldn't continue college and do that too. And everybody was really happy except my mom and dad. <laughs> since I quit college, but then uh, we got $10 a day on that tour a piece, and all expenses were paid, and it was a 14-day tour all over the South, and anyway, when I got home, I had $140, so I went and... That was a lot of money, though. Uh, yeah, wow, and I went to uh, Delahunty's music store, and uh, bought myself a set of Premier drums, and uh, and after that, I had Ludwig and then after I uh, you know, made a little money and didn't need anything, and then I started endorsing Ludwig and they gave me all that stuff <laughs> when I didn't particularly need it. But I prefer Ludwig, they're nice people. And, and uh, I got a lot, like I got a set of uh, 75th anniversary set. They're like mahogany with eagles engraved in them. And, but, uh, Chad Smith from the Chili Peppers said that it's kind of the same thing, except he stole <laughs> he had go to the music store and steal a drum. He said, now that I'm a star, they give them to me. Yeah. He says, so I'm the Robin Hood of rock. I give them to my friends who can't afford them now. But, <laughs> but so did, was there a special uh, sizes that you preferred on the drums, or did you just get whatever you could get? Well, uh, I didn't know you know one size from another, and uh, I'm not really a connoisseur of drums. Like if, uh, like after... You know, I always carried, you know, wanted to have my own drums wherever I went. Like we went to uh, Sonny Curtis and Joe B. Mullen. I went to England with the Earlys in 1960, and uh, I didn't take any drums with me. I just played whatever was there. And uh, but uh, oh, we were in England in 1958. Uh, a fellow from Premier came and came to some of the shows, and they made me a set, uh, uh, which is in the Musicians Hall of Fame. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it, uh, I didn't know what to order. You know, I said, what do you want? And I said, well, I'd like a, you know, a tom. And I'd like two big toms on the floor, like for Bo Diddley, playing Bo Diddley or something. So they made those for me. And uh, anyway, that's what I played. Uh, 
Till I Kiss You, the Everly Brothers, uh, bloom, bloom, <laughs> those two drums. Which a lot of people refer to. They, if I was drummers, were wondering how would they do that. You know, what, what kind of what size drums are those? And yeah. heard a lot of drummers actually bring that song up. Well, that's great. That, that's a compliment. Uh, the Everly Brothers did the Perry Como show sometime in that period, and I guess it's when probably '59 or '60 when when that record came out and. Uh, uh, they said, I, you know, drummer can't do that, so they did it on the timpanis. Drummer probably didn't have Tom Tom. And sometime or the other, when uh, uh, I saw Everly Brothers documentary or something, Chet Atkins said that was the first time he saw that, that kind of rig in the studio. You know, everybody sort of just played, you know, they didn't, they didn't care much for drums in the old days. The Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum has been celebrating the men and women who make the music of our lives since 2006. The Musicians Hall of Fame is the one and only museum in the world that honors the talented musicians who played on the greatest recordings of all time. It's a music city, huh? It's, uh, I mean, where else are you going to get the cats, all the cats that are in this room? The Grammy Museum Gallery at the Musicians Hall of Fame is an interactive facility that allows guests to explore the process of making a recording. Take drum lessons with Ringo Starr. Sing on stage with Ray Charles. Write a song with Desmond Child, rap with Nelly, or be Garth Brooks in our recording studio experience. Located in the heart of downtown Nashville, in the first floor of the historic Nashville Municipal Auditorium. Come see what you've heard at the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum. Hi, I'm Tyler Rudesheim, Director of Events at the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum. Located within the historic National Municipal Auditorium, the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum is one of the most unique spaces in downtown Nashville, offering a versatile environment that caters to events of all sizes. Your guests will love this truly national experience. We specialize in corporate dinners, music industry events, receptions, and more. Contact me today to book your next event. With you guys, it was there was a really heartfelt it was passionate, and it, and it was connected to something that, as we know, it was more than meaningful, which played so well for us as young blues musicians, just aspiring. Uh, but we, we already had like a, a little bit of, and I'm looking at it, a kickstart, and I'm, I'm realizing there's, there's a definite connect with, you, you can't mess around and show off playing blues a lot of people sort yeah, of sort of did, sort of did yeah. and sort of and some of it was fun and it mutated into something different we were in our own little way trying to just emulate as best as we could if you mess with it you screw it up <laughs> oh, yeah, you which did. is like is the it? whole and later on for for blues playing it was so important like uh, peter green who formed fleetwood mac John McVie, he, he would literally be on his knees, the bass player in Fleetwood Mac, if, if he was standing here with me. <laughs> you go to, to anyone like Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, Paul McCartney, <laughs> I mean, I, you can go on forever as to where they drew, you know, all things you've heard before, and I'm just somewhere in the queue with musicians that I know. That's, uh, just, that's too nice. You no, know, but <laughs> hey, it's always love. You know, in our world, we get uh, some of that too. But but there's always a connect to where it comes from. You, you sure. must have met Paul from from the Beatles. And yeah, he told me one time it was for the crickets there wouldn't be any Beatles, which was well, a nice compliment. I remember sitting uh, years back when when life was a party and and it, oh it, man and. Uh, I was sitting at Ringo's house, uh, who I knew a little bit uh, back in the day, uh, and he suddenly turned around because I was fairly active and with Fleetwood Mac, and he said, "What am I doing? He's enjoying life, you know." And, and was, well, God knows, one of the Beatles. He said, "Mick, it suddenly dawned on me. I don't have a drum kit in my house." He's uh, he would love that, and of course, John, this afternoon is going to be full of regret that he wasn't here. <laughs> it's such a pleasure it's to be meeting and talking to you. Oh, uh, it is unbelievable awesome. pleasure. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
like one thing I always wanted to ask Chet, and I originally we were going to do this show in 1997, uh -huh. and I'd asked Chet. I said, well, you know, would you would you do this show? It, it, it wasn't called Musicians Hall of Fame then because we didn't. There was no Musicians mm -hmm. Hall of Fame. I just thought it'd be cool that when I had the guitar shops to to uh, do something that musicians would enjoy seeing and as well as regular people, you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the things I wanted to ask Chet was, how did it feel seeing the Beatles playing a Chet Atkins, you know, guitar on the Ed Sullivan show and then how many people were influenced and, in, in, you know, basically bought Gretsch guitars for that reason, you know, first you and then, then the Beatles and... You, do you know have ever thought about how many drummers that you've influenced that because you were like you know when, when y'all you, when you guys were inducted to the Musicians Hall of Fame in '08 mm -hmm. I think it was and, uh, and Keith Richards came in and said if it weren't for you guys there wouldn't probably wouldn't have been a Beatles and there definitely wouldn't have been a Rolling Stones. Yeah, that was uh, mighty nice. It's hardly embarrassing. Hey, nice to be back in Nashville, ladies and gentlemen. How many are left? I don't know. But, uh, look, it's my job and my honor, actually, to try and tell you something about some guys that I don't know if any, many Americans actually know the effect that these guys behind me had in England and in Europe, you know, because you're Americans and you know what you like, you know. <laughs> And, uh, but these are the guys, without these guys, you probably wouldn't have the Beatles, you certainly wouldn't have had the Stones, you know. <laughs> it was the idea of this band, this bunch of musicians that actually wrote them, sung them, recorded them, put them out. This idea of a unit that could actually operate together, that actually turned us all on. It was, uh, without them, like I say, that we'd be nowhere. They were the whole idea, probably the first global, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it spreads and it goes around, but probably the whole idea of, of any of us anywhere else was they sprung from the idea of these guys from Lubbock. And you're going, where? <laughs> and, and it's funny how things can spring from out of nowhere, you know. And uh, I know I did. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, I couldn't have sprung if these guys didn't have spring in the first place. Uh, so, I mean, without really much further ado, I'd really like to, in uh, my joy and honor, to uh, induct the crickets into this musical hall of fame. You're so nice. <laughs> but I don't think they said that just to be nice. I mean, that, you know. Yeah, well, Paul McCartney told us that one time, one for the crickets, it wouldn't be any Beatles. <laughs> Of course, he didn't give me any money. I was going to say, you didn't get paid enough, <laughs> if that's the case, you know. It's really funny because back when we, uh, when we first started, we were on the road, uh, I think it was a 17-week tour, and we had like four days off during the whole thing, and rode, oh, uh, and there was like 20 acts or maybe 22. Uh, it varied because uh, some of the people on the show had better gigs, and then they'd come back and work on that show. And, but it's two buses carrying, uh, start, except for Fats Domino and... Uh, Chuck Berry and they had their own rides. Anyway, it was great, to, uh, all those people. And I sure learned a lot from those guys, like uh, Tanu, who was a uh, uh, Fat Domino's drummer, and uh, uh, and Little Richard's drummer named Charles Connors. He was in The Girl Can't Help It. Yeah. And, uh, which I think we saw like 10 or 12 times, probably. But, you, you took my question. I was going to say, who did you listen to? Who influenced you? But there you go, right? Well, I, like in school, I heard, uh, you know, on the radio, and, and I think I had a couple of Gene Krupa records. That was, uh, I was pretty impressed with them. Of course, Brady Rich was playing. And then I got into rock and roll about the, you know, in high school. And, uh, well, 
So rock, when you say rock and roll, what, who did you consider rock and roll? Because you kind of were in the genesis of it, weren't you? Uh, I guess uh, I guess I, it was country. It wasn't country. There's a lot of country music. It was a lot of it good. Like Hank Williams was big, and and uh, the pop music. And then they just started playing stuff. Uh, we started listening to uh, Gatemouth Brown and some people in uh, uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. It was a high high watt station or high watt something, but you could hear it in, late at night in Lubbock and. Uh, they playing like uh, uh, Rock With Me Henry and uh, Fats Domino and and uh, Bill Haley, of course, was that was rock and roll, I thought, but you know, we liked all that stuff. Buddies, I sort of, uh, we'd been friends before, but uh, uh, he, he came and uh, joined, I was playing with a country band, and he'd sit in and play that, that sort of stuff. And, but Little Richard and Fats Domino, first record I bought was... Uh, Going to the river, fast down the record. That was your first record. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. Since you mentioned Paul McCartney, do you know what his first record that he bought was? Mm -mm. Bebop Balloon. Mm. Recorded here in Nashville, Quonset Hut. Hey, we're going to be right back. We're going to talk about a really, really famous song. Just a second. Cabaret is now open for a new season with shows all the way through 2019. Call now at 615-327-4630 or go online to raystevenscabaret.com. Come see me here at the Cabaret in Nashville in 2019. Hi, I'm Tyler Rudesheim, Director of Events at the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum. Located within the historic Nashville Municipal Auditorium, the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum is one of the most unique spaces in downtown Nashville, offering a versatile environment that caters to events of all sizes. Your guests will love this truly Nashville experience. We specialize in corporate dinners, music industry events, receptions, and more. Contact me today to book your next event. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame with J.I. Allison. J.I., um, one of the biggest pop rock records of all time was was Peggy Sue. It's Peggy Sue, and you got a great story with that. I don't want to. It's not, I want you to tell the story. I don't want to say any more about it. Well, old buddy and I were riding around in his '55 Oldsmobile, and uh, we usually had a guitar in the car, and I I couldn't play a lick at the time. But anyway, he had a song story called Cindy Lou. It was all a what they called a cha-cha beat or a rumba beat time. If you knew Cindy Lou, then you'd know why I feel blue without Cindy. And I had dated a girl in uh, high school named Peggy Sue Guerin, and she moved to uh, California. But anyway, I still, she didn't ever like me much. And uh, she got to where she hated me, but <laughs> and, um, uh, she passed away a while back, and I'm sorry that, about that. But uh, anyway, I talked Buddy into changing it to Peggy Sue and, and doing like <laughs> paradiddles. And so we changed it. And, uh, and you those, that from Bo Diddley, right? Uh, that no, that's, that was not Fade Away. This was just paradiddles like. Oh. You know, little, 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 Bo Diddley was like <laughs> Not fade away, but uh, we heard that on the way to town today uh, by the Stones. Sure, did a good record of it. Yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, we changed it to Peggy Sue. In those days, we didn't have a producer. I mean, Norman Petty uh, was at his studio and recorded it, but we sort of just played it and he recorded it, and that was it. But uh, anyway, uh, I had to go out in the the entry entryway to the studio. Because, I mean, that was pretty loud, the, uh, the drums like that. And uh, it was eating up everything else, the vocal and the bass and the, the guitar even. But anyway, we did it once, and, and uh, uh, I, I didn't get it right. And I, you know, I flustered in the middle. And, but he said, okay, don't get it this time. It's Cindy Lou again. I said, oh, man. <laughs> so we got it the second time. And uh, it, I love recording those days because you played it and nobody mixed it in the fix. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. And uh, it, how you play it, you know, if it got too loud or too soft, that's okay. That's, it's, if you write a song, you, if it goes slower and faster, that's the way you wrote it. And in my case, if I write a song, it's, sung, it's out of tune. 
the way I wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's the way I see these out of tune. In fact, uh, uh, we had, when we did uh, the Ed Sullivan show the first time, we had uh, had to sign it with AFTRA. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like AFTRA if it's enough to get in, but uh, we made uh, we got a thousand dollars for doing it. And of course, the agency and the management got twenty percent, so we got eight hundred dollars and said, "Well, you got to be an AFTRA, and that'll be eight hundred dollars." So they took it. And <laughs> anyway, that you know, it's a singers' union and. Uh, anyway, I, I sang so good, sing so good, as a matter of fact, that uh, I get a hundred a month pension. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I said, the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum has been celebrating the men and women who make the music of our lives since 2006. The Musicians Hall of Fame is the one and only museum in the world that honors the talented musicians who played on the greatest recordings of all time. It's a music city, huh? It's, uh, I mean, where else are you going to get the cats? All the cats that are in this room. The Grammy Museum Gallery at the Musicians Hall of Fame is an interactive facility that allows guests to explore the process of making a recording. Take drum lessons with Ringo Starr. Sing on stage with Ray Charles. Write a song with Desmond Child. Rap with Nelly. Or be Garth Brooks in our recording studio experience. Located in the heart of downtown Nashville, in the first floor of the historic Nashville Municipal Auditorium. Come see what you've heard at the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum. Anyway, I lived, you know, uh, all those guys drumming. Uh, Earl Palmer, was, he played on a lot of uh, uh, Fat Stone and Little Richard stuff in, in New Orleans. Yeah. And uh, he, he was, Hal Blaine gives him a lot of credit, too, because he's actually got Hal... Blaine, the real famous stu studio drummer in, in L.A., uh -huh. played on, for those who don't know, played on Beach Boys and Mamas and Papas and everything. And, yeah. and Earl, he gets some credit for getting him started in the recording business. Well. Yeah. Er, I played a lot with Earl. I was good friends with him. In fact, I went in the Air Force Reserve in uh, 1961, and Earl liked my cymbals better than he liked his, so I just left them with him for that for six months, and I was in the... Air Force yeah. Reserve. You get them back? Yeah, yeah. I did. So, um, what, what, people are going to want to know, to hear from you, what happened, you know, as far as Buddy Holly and the Crickets? How did that, how did that go apart and was it coming back together at, at the end? And it, it was coming back together and I didn't really know it for a long time, but, uh, uh, Sonny Curtis and Joe B and I were hanging out in Clovis and nothing was happening. And well, uh, J.I. and Buddy were playing just the two of them down at the roller rink. And I, I think that's how they got, man, they got so tight, you know, just playing uh, the sock hops down at the roller rink. And uh, they played great together. And, uh, man, they could just almost feel what the guy, what the other one's going to do next, you know. And so uh, they went over to Clovis and... Um, and recorded um, that'll be the day uh, we had done it in Nashville but not not nearly that that good and um, they recorded that'll be the day uh, and um, and they named themselves the crickets they uh, Norman said you guys need to be a group and they liked uh, uh, insects and so uh, they started looking through the dictionary and I think it was J.I. that came up with the crickets uh, and uh, <laughs> And then they, they became the Crickets. And, for the, and Sonny Curtis was an original member of the Crickets, right? Uh, well, he wasn't actually a member of the Crickets, but he played fiddle and guitar with uh, Buddy and Bob Montgomery. Mm -hmm. He played with Buddy before I did. And Buddy and Bob. Is a, yeah. Buddy and Bob is a country band. And Don Guest played steel guitar, and a, a fellow named Larry Welburn played uh, slap bass. It was a good band. And I finally got in that band. but. Uh, uh, anyway, B Buddy and I liked uh, rock and roll better than the other, all of the other ones actually. And um, but anyway, we started the crickets in '56, I guess. And uh, uh, but anyway, it was all going great. And then uh, I got married, didn't help a thing. And then Buddy got married, and every musician knows what happens then. Like you're gonna go on the road all the time, you know. And so. Uh, it just uh, and Buddy moved to New York, and uh, Joe B and I were going to move with him. Uh, when we split up, the agreement was when he wanted to stay in New York, and J.I. and I wanted 
he wanted to go to New York, and J.I. and I wanted to stay down in Texas. So the agreement was that J.I. and I would work as the crickets, and Buddy would work as Buddy Holly. And then if we ever got uncomfortable with that and wanted to get back together, all it took was a phone call. And uh, so the night Buddy was killed, J.I. and I were trying to call him from Lubbock, and we had called ahead to, uh, I think, uh, Fargo, North Dakota, or wherever he was going to be the next night, and left a message at the next venue he was going to play to have him call us when he got there. And all of a sudden, you know, like, uh, I think Peggy Sue didn't particularly want to move to New York, and uh, uh, it just didn't feel right. And, but after, Buddy, after we split up, it sure didn't feel right because there wasn't anything happening. But uh, we tried to call Buddy. Actually, the, he was playing in Clear Lake, Iowa, and we tried to call him from there, and uh, he wasn't, and he had already left or something. There was one payphone backstage, I think. But uh, uh, Waylon Jennings told me, uh, year, I think about 70, 80, he told me that, that Buddy said, uh, hey man, uh, you know, I don't really like the way this is going. I want to get uh, J.I. and Joe V. back. And uh, Waylon said, well, uh, you know, I'm play, playing bass. And uh, Buddy said, yeah, but not very good. And he said, uh, you're, so we're going to go to England again, because England was always really good to us. And, and Buddy said, uh, you don't need to play bass, man. You're a good singer, and you're going to open the show singing and get J.I. and Joe B., and we'll do a tour like that. And I'm like, wow. It's really fun to hear that, because that's the way I felt. And, you know, Buddy's my best friend. And it's hard. To, you know, after all we've been through, and just stop it is is pretty miserable. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. But that's Because when you're happened. in a band like that, it kind of becomes your identity, you know, to, and then everybody you know always has the band, you know, and you're kind of, mm. <laughs> Yeah. You know? just, so, so I guess naming Peggy Sue worked, and you got married to Peggy Sue. I did, yeah. Yeah. And we were married for nine years, and we were, I think we were together about three months of that nine years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth more than that, but, I mean, she was a nice lady, and, nice folks and that was just a uh it's hard to be rock and roll and stay home yeah yeah well um i'm doing this really like winging it so i'm gonna guess that we've about hit that half hour that we're going to be allotted for this show yeah but i just want to tell you how much i appreciate it and and uh doing this and and um you know, when we first opened the museum, it was kind of hard to get people to go with somebody that didn't have any track record doing the museums, you know, and and you were the, I've told this a lot of times, you, not to you, but because you knew, <laughs> but um, it, it meant a lot to me that, that you wanted to put your drums in there and, and, and you actually, instead of making me feel like you're not worthy. You, you, you were like, I'm not worthy kind of acting, and I appreciate that because that meant a lot. <laughs> well, know? man, I really appreciate having my drums here, and uh, uh, if anybody doesn't know about it, they need to come to the Musicians Hall of Fame because it's, it's my favorite museum of the, like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. If to, that means in, uh, in, well, in Norwegian. <laughs> well, hey, they're, they're they're all good. I love them all. But oh yeah, I do too. But this is my favorite. Well, it is me too. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I, I you know I love you and I appreciate it a lot. Well, thank you, Joe, and uh, uh, thanks for all the letting all my friends in free. Hey, is is any of your friends are, are our friends, you know? And yeah. so, hope you guys come back and see us next week when we'll have somebody not as cool as Ji, but oh. they'll be cool. Thank you, Joe. Nice. That's very nice.